Hello, everybody. Good morning from Brazil. I am Patricia Barbosa, and it's a pleasure to be with you once again. We are reaching the end of the Labyrinths of Origin series, my postdoctoral project developed at the National Institute of Industrial Property Brazil in partnership with Instituto de Historia de la Europa Mediterránea and Consiglio Nacionale de la Ricerche. As you can see, after three webinars in Portuguese, this one being in English, with a Brazilian and Italian accent as an example of how roads cross and generate new possibilities. Today is a special day, as 150 years ago, the italian Brazilian paths merged and became strong. 150 years ago, 400 Italians get left Genoa on the ship La Sofia, heading to Brazil, and they would have lived their first week in Brazil. Now, 150 years later, we are completing the journey with intellectual property as a guide and distinguished products that highlight and value origin. We have already done three webinars. Here, where the first we address the historical interactions between Brazil and Italy and the relationship between both countries and intellectual property. In the second, the theme was how design influenced the displacement of origin by allowing products and services to reach different locations. In the third, we discuss, discuss how coffee travels between Brazil and Italy and how it traveled from Vale do Café to the rest of Brazil. Today, the final webinar question goes back to the beginning of the labyrinth. How to avoid the origin that moves to not get lost in the future? Is it generating new origins? So, as the webinar ser series are connected to BI programming schools at INPI Brazil, today the first two lectures were selected in the postgraduate course Geographic Indications and Other Distinctive Signs of Collective Use of the Academic of Intellectual Property Innovation and Development of INPI, which I'm responsible for nowadays. In it, students were invited to debate topics of interest to them, exercising their collective spirit. But at first, I'd like to call Professor Celso Lage to say some words for us. He's senior specialist in industrial property and postgraduate coordinator of the Acad Academy of INPI. Please, Celso. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, I would like to thank the speakers for participating in this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Massimo, Dr. Rita, Dr. Tabata, and Dr. Fernando. And thanks, Dr. Alessandra and Dr. Giovanni. I, I would like to thank in my behalf and on behalf of the Brazilian NPI and our postgraduate program. This is a topic of great interest for a country of continental dimensions and multicultural. Brazil has a great cultural diversity it is very important to us discuss themes and topics like uh, uh, geographical indication. It's a great pleasure to have you present in this meeting. I thank at this meeting and I thank the audience who are watching now. And I want to apologize because uh, we are speaking in English and Brazilian audience and we, we won't have the translation during the all presentations. Now, I return the word to Dr. Patricia Barbosa to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Celso. The video will be on the YouTube of ICM, and I believe people can put the, um, I forgot the words, but the little words that you can put on the video to, to translate to Portuguese or any other any other language you want. Please remember the word people is and the um, subtitles. Okay. People can put the subtitles on YouTube to change the, the language. And unfortunately, Professor Sabatini won't be able to join us because he had a last minute emergency. 
So now I'd like to invite Professor Alessandra Narciso to join us. I wrote across two years ago at a seminar, and since then, new paths have been emerging. Without her kind support, this webinar would not be happening today. And that's why she will be the moderator today. Once again, thank you very much for your precious help, Alessandra. The floor is yours. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Professor uh, Lage. Um, I'm very uh, happy for this cooperation. We're coming to the last seminar. And I will uh, briefly introduce the first speaker of uh, today's seminar, uh, which is Dr. Tabata Benitz. And uh, she uh, will present uh, uh, the case of uh, um, Amazon origin, the case of the Tefe National Forest Collective Trademarks. I will just give a brief bio about uh, Tabata. Uh, she's from the Institute, uh, uh, Instituto de Desenvolvimento Sustentável uh, Mamirawa. And um, her background, <laughs> she's a PhD student currently in environmental sciences at the Federal University of Amazonas. And she has a master's degree in biological sciences at the University of Valle do Paraiba. Uh, she uh, has interest in environmental management and intellectual property. So Tabata, the floor is yours. Uh, just briefly before you go on, we have 20 minutes, so I will alert you just a bit, a bit longer, maybe five minutes. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation and opportunity to be here, share with you this experience. Uh, can you see right my, my screen? Is everything okay? Very well. Okay, so I will start here. Uh, so, like she said, I will bring you here the experience about the collective brand the case of the Tefé National Forest in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, like the collective brand, this work is also collective, and this is the group who uh, thinking about the, this presentation and uh, organize the, the information that we will bring here. And so it's me, Barbara Cabral, Gorete Falcão, and Marcela, and Marcela Amazonas. Uh, we did this work in, with uh, teacher Patricia in a NPI um, doutorado, a doctor of the NPI, and we have a, a lot of uh, orientation about the, this presentation to be here today. So we want to thank you, Patricia, too, for this uh, opportunity. So, um, before starting our presentation, I want to invite you to imagine yourself sailing on the Amazon rivers and feeling the power of the forest and its charm. So if you look at this photo, just imagining you're here, uh, it's like the um, identify from the, the collective brand. We can see here the river, the, the dynamics of the water, and then uh, we can feel some uh, this energy to understand better what I will bring for you today. Uh, about the Fed, the city where the, the collective brand is um, resonates, uh, we have here this name original from Topebas, or Topebas in Portuguese, it's an indigenous stream and means a small village. So uh, we have this name for the Fed in the past and now we have the Fed because it's like uh, in Portuguese, the uh, Fé, because the, um, a lot of church we have here. Uh, we stay this distance from Manaus, and um, uh, we have uh, 6,000 habitants in the, the city. It's like an uh, island. We just uh, arrived here by plane or by boat. Uh, we can see here a little about the Fé in this photo and uh, the map. About the Tefé National Forest, it's a protected area. Uh, who manages this area? It's the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, it's in New in Portuguese. In this location, we have 900 families uh, living in the territory, grouped in 99 communities. 
and uh, we have a three rivers. Um, you can see in this photo uh, one of those rivers. It's the Fe, Bawana, and Kurumitachi Baixo in Portuguese. We have these rivers, and then um, when we have the the principal river of this tree, we have the others uh, small rivers and small um, access for the communities, like this photo we can see here. The representative uh, association about the the Fe Floresta Nacional de Fe Fauna. It's a, a PAF, the Association of Agriculture, Pulsar of Fauna de Fe and Surrounds. The problem we have here about the, the production and and um, the parts of the economy. Okay. Excuse me. I, um, excuse me. I don't want to interrupt you, but we are still on the first slide, right? You doesn't. Um, you didn't no, change I, any slides. You. No, okay. I, I changed. Just to be. Changed a lot of slides. Okay. <laughs> show. It doesn't so, show at least on the slide. So. Uh, maybe. But we are still seeing the first slide, Tabata. Um, I don't know what happened, but uh, maybe now I was passing. I just to share again to see it's okay. Can you see it? See. Yeah. Yes, we can see can it. See. Yes, we can see. Can okay. you? Yeah, go, you can go back to the slide you were talking. So we briefly okay, go to them because we we have we missed the images okay i don't know what happened so let's restart but say a little fast for we don't lose more time and then it's this was the photo i put for your imagining uh, sailing on the amazon rivers and i was just saying about the dynamic of the rivers we can see here on the representative uh, of Fond de Fe for their collective brand. And here it's a little about the Fe, just saying for you. Um, we can hear, uh, see here the front of the city and uh, the map with the localization. And uh, there's another one, you can see better the river and uh, the um, identify for the collective brand we, we see here. It's very similar. Um, okay, I was here. Then here is the problem we have in the community: uh, economic activities based mainly on family farming, commercial exploration, and in efficient public policies. And this uh, this is a history problem. We have um, the the communities with a lot of products with good quality, but see, not valorized. So we have to work in alternatives and um, works like this, like the collective brand to improve and um, put better pricing for these communities to have uh, more quality of life. The goal of our work is present in the relevance, creation process and challenge to implement it the Flonata Fair collective brand and the possible benefits of registering the collective brand for the community. So what the collective brand will, bri will bring uh, of positive to the community? That's our discussion here. The justification for the collective brand uh, was three points. The first of them is development of the various income generation activities and direct use of natural biodiversity resources. Uh, the other ones it provide visibility to new marks for APAFI products and add value to the product. The methodology we used here was the documentary research of trademark and application film records exploratory and bibliographical value links in the methodology I will show for you in the next steps we use to mapping um, the problems of the products to go to the market, size the, their products 
and uh, the quality qualitative uh, hearing the producers from the, the Flona Nacional de Tefé. Um, we have here the steps we, we put since uh, we started the project. The first one was approval of the project by WIPO and here in Constant. So we have a project uh, receiving resources about WIPO. Uh, to do all these steps to uh, arrive into the register of the collective brand. Presentation of the schedule and process to the processors and the partners. Um, diagnosis about the, the products will be put from the, the brand because they, they have a lot of productions, so we have to choose uh, only two to be party in this moment to the collective brand, creation of the controlling board, preparation of the documents to put in, in the NPE and have the, the register, training with the products about the collective brand for them understand what the collective brand and uh, then disseminate this for the others. Uh, trade market uh, deposit within PE protocol and monitoring of the application, and then um, event uh, of launch uh, to implementation strategies and um, um, to show for the partners and markets the new collective brand we have here. This all is the partners uh, we have in this product and uh, this project. And it's very important to put our attention here because if we don't have the partners, maybe it's not possible to work in, with the collective brands because in Amazon we have a lot of uh, problems with the logistics, uh, communication, so uh, so uh, difficult to to do uh, some projects here because we have a lot of resources and uh, possibly it's, uh, to make it real. Um, the collective brand. We have here one of the first steps I have presented uh, was workshops and meeting with the community we, uh, where we discussions about the prioritization of the products because we have to put in the first moment in the collective brand that products that products will be uh, more fast in the market because um, we have to thinking about quality um, if this product is already um, okay to to be to go to the supermarket and so on, then we we have this prioritization is often in this meeting. Chose of a procedural substitute uh, to, will be the um, association um, who is responsible about the markets. In this case, it was a path. Development of visual that five construct, construction of usage regulations for the producers um, put you know, in the same line uh, the quality and the process of production in training about collective branding. So we have here uh, three products, the product is, uh, producers chosen, chat notes and derivatives. Cassava and honey pollen. I will show here very fast the um, three tables with the uh, the the challenge tables about the flower and derivatives. We have here these results with the meeting when we ask it to the producers. What's the difficult to um, planting? What's the difficult to extraction benefits and so on? And then they they say every day, so we can see it's a long step, a long way uh, for this product to to arrive to the formal market or international market. And then we have a lot of things to work in, in this product. For we look at them and say, ah, it's okay, it's ready to use the collective brands, uh, not only in the territory or only in Amazon or Brazil, but in other places. 
So we have here this challenge for the, the flower and the rates. And this is the, the product more prepared. We can see, uh, say this way. We have another one that the, the difficulties are bigger and then this one is smaller. So we have this one, uh, or another challenge table for honey and pollen, and the chestnut. For the collect brand, we just put in, in the registration honey and pollen, flower and derivatives, because we, we, anal we analyze it with the, the community, these two products are more um, uh, faster to go to the market, then chestnut will be put in another register in the future because we have more difficulty here to put in the market. We have here a picture about the group in the community, in the meetings, we have a lot of um, meetings to, to finish the, the, the procedural. Uh, the procedural substitute was a path because they they are in the territory, they are representative for this group and then continues to be the responsible about the collective brand from the FM. Uh, here we have a result of the village and registration was in January in the last year and we have a um, um, uh, a launch in Tefé in Manaus to show the product to partners and um, guaranteed opportunities to, to close new deals. So we have here some pictures of this moment. We have um, representatives of APAF and Milena of NP Brazil. And uh, the next steps to continue the project and put the collective brands in the market, it's presentation of challenge to the partners, seek financial to solve the problems, promote and disseminate the Fonate Fair collective brand, implement usage regulations for priority products, hold a content meeting to keep the process alive and active, work on a path in managed process, create a business plan for the collective brand, improve the quality of products, make, map a new markets, place the products on the market with the collective brands, and create materials to understand the brand and disseminate it in all Flona TFA communities. So we have a long steps <laughs> to, to do, and um, last week I have a, a good news that WIPO will put more money, more investment in the collective brand with a second project to work these um, problems we have here. So we have now uh, the mark, the collective brand registered, but not in the market already because we have to win all this, this problem to put it in, the, in another state and uh, international maybe. But nowadays we just have uh, uh, the selling in the local places in the fair or Manaus and so on. So we have a lot of to work, but the collective brand bring to the group to a path uh, more conditional to work, more um, organization, uh, market view. So we consider it it's a good experience for them and for the product to, uh, product to have this visibility on the market. And the final considerations, it's leverage a group of producers, especially nuts and flower in the Amazon, volume regionality, production and production quality, it's the most prevalent here, territorial development to be based on the market strategy and disseminating distinctive signal uh, important when we use it to the forest, uh, coming around an organization capital of unit common entrepreneurial proposals. They contribute to differentiate the market and identify quality products. Uh, we can say that the collective brands bring a visibility already uh, 
like now, more people were going to know that the Flona de Fe had this project, what is the Fe, what is Flona. So we are very happy to have this opportunity to communicate more this experience. And um, we are very um, uh, exciting for the continuous pro uh, process and have uh, a good results for the comments. Here we have the, the photos and the contacts of all the people in our group. If you have interest to know more and uh, contact to us, you can do this. And uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry for my English. It's a little uh, not so good, but I will improve. And um, I am I'm very happy to listen to another and people are going to, to a presentation here today. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tabata. Thank you very much. It's really interesting case, this project uh, that you're you know, working on. So now we'll, I'll uh, we'll, uh, leave the floor to the second speaker, today's seminar. Uh, and, uh, Fernando Pineiro. Um, he will discuss his presentation is about geographical indications of cheese, Brazil, Italy, comparisons and consumer considerations. Uh, a bit brief about Fernando. Fernando uh, is currently doing his master in intellectual property law at the uh, National uh, Institute of Intellectual Property Brazil, the INPI, the Academy. He um, is graduated in law and he has uh, published extensively in the realm of law and intellectual property. Uh, Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for your kind words. Uh, I'm sorry, I think my, my camera is freezing, but as long as you can hear me and see the presentation, it's okay. I so can hear you. Perfect, so I will start to share. Can you see my presentation? I can yes. see, it, but it would be nice if you can just uh, have it in the presentation. Perfect. Yes, uh, that's great. Perfect. So let's start. So good morning to everyone. As Alessandra has already introduced me, I'm Fernando. My research is about geographical indications of cheese, Brazil and Italy, comparisons and considerations of consumers. Uh, this research was uh, produced by me and my colleague, Wilson Honorato, but today the presentation will be made by only, only by me. So first, a quick introduction. Uh, this presentation explores the geographical indication, GI, in Brazil and Italy, highlighting the unique characteristics associated Sad. with each. Sorry? Uh, continue associated with each type of GI. Just one second. Tabad, Tabad. Can, uh, perfect. May I continue? Please, please, it was, uh, yes, please go ahead, sorry. Okay, well, oh, no problem. Considerations will also be given about the Brazilian consumer law in relation to the possible falsifications of the origin of products. And I promise I will be short, I will not extend my time. So a little about methodology. Uh, this research is exploratory as it aims to uh, address a topic without expecting to resource it. The sources used were Brazilian and European legislation on geographical indications, as well as market data and bibliography. Uh, although the subject of GI geographical indications is quite extensive, the research was limited to cheese, and we will explain that later. At the end of the data, it was possible to evaluate the differences between the two systems regarding GI concepts and add some comments regarding Brazilian consumer law. So uh, at first, to begin the, the topic, uh, just a quick picture showing the cheese is a new universal product. Uh, oh, sure, we have uh, more some countries that consume more than others, but we can see that, uh, well, cheese is, is everywhere. 
But first, we need to address the economic relevance of cheese. Uh, it's important to understand why it's the subject of this research. So first, a little comparison between Italy and Brazil regarding to production. So we can see that the annual production of Italy is, is way higher than Brazilian. Um, and we can see that even when we consider production per capita, uh, Italy produces a lot more cheese than Brazil. And when we consider the global ranking of the biggest producers of cheese, Italy is the fourth biggest producer of cheese, while Brazil is, is quite behind in the, in the list. So there's some room to improve in Brazil. But you may ask me, why? Why would we improve in cheese production in Brazil? Uh, the global cheese market was valued at over 83.4 billion US dollars in 2022, and it's forecast to reach over 102 billion by 2028, so it's a lot of money. As demand for cheese consumption and production increases, the global cheese market is expected to grow annually by 7.25%. So it's a very, very interesting market to invest on. Here's some more data now for, from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, uh, I, I apologize for the graphics in Portuguese, but I will, I will explain it to you. We can see here the expectation of increasing value of many agricultural products. And we can see here in the third graphic, in the green, green line that represents cheese, the, the expected value of cheese. Then in the short term, from 2016 to 2024, there's a high expectation of increase in the value of products related to cheese. So it's a very interesting product to, to invest. But we now must enter some definitions. Uh, first of all, the, the general definition of GI, geographical indication GI, is a sign used on products that have a specific geographical origin and possess qualities of reputation that are due to that origin. It provides legal protection and promotes authenticity and quality. Okay, but we must understand some differences between the two legislations, the European one uh, that is used in, in Italy and the Brazilian one that we'll see in the next slides. So in Italy, they use the regulation uh, 510 from 2006 that creates two types of GIs mainly the two types used in this research. They are the protected geographical indication, PGI, and the protected designation of origin, PGO. The PGI uh, is the name of a region or a place that designates an agricultural product originating from that region, which has quality and reputation associated with the geographical origin, and that at least one, usually the most important, stage of production or extraction takes place there. While the PDO is the only geographical name of a country, city, region, or locality in its territory, designating a product or service, service whose characteristics are due exclusively or essentially to the geographical environment, including natural factors, and that all stages are carried out on site. This end is very important for the difference between PGI and PDO, and for the difference between the, the different species of GI in Brazil. Now, speaking exclusively about Brazil, here we follow mainly the Brazilian law 9279 for 1996, and the uh, ENPE is the acronym for the Brazilian IP office. Uh, I understand that in, in Italy, the Italian IP office is not responsible for registering G GIs, but in Brazil, we register in, the, in our IP office. So the ordinance number four from 2022, that also creates two types of GIs, 
and the, the names are very similar to what we saw in the, Europe, in the European legislation, but there are some differences. In Brazil, we have the indication of origin, IP, is the geographical name of a country, city, region, or locality in its, or in its territory, or its demony, which has now a center of extraction, production, or manufacture of a certain product, or the provision of service. While a designation of origin, a DO, is a geographical name of a country, city, region, or locality in its territory, or its demony, designating products or service whose qualities or characteristics are due exclusively or essentially to the environment, including natural factors. Well, from here we can already see some differences between the, def the Brazilian definitions, the Italian and the European definitions uh, that we will see in the next slide. So we have some major differences between the two, the two legislations. Although the names are quite similar, PGI and IP, DOP and DO, Brazilian legislation allows the registration of GIs for services, which is not allowed in the Europe, and does not make registration conditional on whether or not all the production stages take place at the same site, which turns out to be vital in the Italian case. It's the main difference between PGI and PGO. PGI and PGO, uh, yes. So some more differences uh, now related to numbers uh, and exclusively speaking about cheese. In Brazil, we have only seven GIs of cheese, of which five are IPs. Uh, we have cheese do Cerrado, cheese Minas Artesanal do Cerro, cheese canastra. We have here a picture of cheese canastra. It's, it's very popular, very famous in Brazil. Cheese with Marson, it is Marajó, and we have only two DOs, cheese Roquefort, that is not even a Brazilian DO, it's not a Brazilian cheese, it's a French, IG, uh, and cheese artesanal serrano. While in Italy, uh, so in Brazil we're having seven GIs of cheese, in Italy they have 56 GIs for cheese, 53 of them are PDOs. And you may ask why the most of them are PGOs and, and not PGIs. Uh, you may remember that the one core difference between the, the two species in the Italian legislation, the European legislation, is that for PGOs, all stages of production or extraction must occur in the same site. Uh, so producers seek the PGO registration uh, more, for the most in comparison with the, the PGI registration, because with PGO products, they can charge more for the products. In Brazil, we don't, we don't have this, this, this differentiation uh, re regarding all stages occurring in the same site. So people don't have the same animals to look for GOs that they have in Italy. So that's why we have more IPs of cheese than GOs. Well, although Italian cheese, PGIs and PGOs are not registered in Brazil, Brazilian consumers are by no means strangers to consuming these products. Currently, four GIs for Italian cheese are being processed by the Ita Brazilian IP office, although not yet re registered. Uh, the Gorgonzola cheese, uh, Asiago, Parmigiano Reggiano, and Grana Padano. Uh, sorry for my bad Italian, sorry if I mispronounced any name, but you'll get the idea. Now we talk about ratifying signs or ratifying expressions. Uh, although not registered in Brazil, the Italian GI sport cheese, attention must be paid to the correct respect and information to the consumer who cannot be misled when consuming their products. In this way, the Brazilian industrial property law that we call in Portuguese LPI in its articles 193 and 194, allows the use of ratifying signs. And what are those? By defining crimes against GIs, the LPI allows a producer who is outside an area delimited by a GI to use terms such as type, species, genus, etc., 
as long as they point out the true origin of the product. So they cannot uh, let the consumer to buy something believing that something comes from that region and it's not. Uh, the European legislation, on the other hand, does not allow the use of ratifying signs or expressions. So it's a, a major difference between the two countries. The representation of this ratifying sign must not be such that, even if present, it is impossible or improbable for the consumer to identify the true origin. And I will show you two examples uh, of this. Uh, I did a little field research myself. I wanted to see how this goes uh, in day-to-day -day life. So I went to a market here in Brazil and I grabbed a package of shredded Parmesan cheese. And I blur with the trademarks, of course, because I don't want to be sued. <laughs> but you can see here that although it says shredded Parmesan cheese in the front, in very big letters, when you turn back the package, you can see here inside this red circle in very, very, very small letters that it's produced in Brazil. It's not produced in Italy at all. So it can mislead the consumer. But I will show you a second example that it's, in my opinion, even worse. It's the same product, shredded Parmesan cheese. Uh, but here uh, we have uh, an additional problem. You can see by the scan of colors of the package that resemble the Italian flag. Uh, it is the Italian flag. Uh, but again, when you turn back the package in very, very small letters here inside this red circle, it's written that it's produced in Brazil. So this second example greatly, in my opinion, greatly misled the consumer to think that it's an Italian product and it's not. So here we have some implications regarding the Brazilian consumer law. In Brazil, we have law number 8078 from 1999 that uh, creates some rights for the Brazilian consumers. And in Article 6, it dictates that the, it's a basic consumer right to receive adequate and clear information about different products and services mm. with correct specification of quantity, characteristics, composition, quality, taxes, etc., and origin, of course. So the consumer cannot be misled. Another concern in the, is the possibility of parasitic competition, in which one person or organization takes advantage of another effort to make unjustified gains by misleading consumers, which is also prohibited by Brazilian law. In other words, the consumer must not be misled. Given that the Brazilian IP office has no police power, consumers, must, consumers who have been harmed must take legal action, either individual or collective, to protect their rights. And now some conclusions, because I'm running out of time. Uh, cheese is an important product for both countries, mainly Italy, but there's some room to increase in Brazil and is expected to increase in value in the short term. Brazil and Italy have different concepts about what can be registered as a GI and the types of GI. Uh, although the definitions and mainly the names are pretty close, there is in Italy a focus on whether the stages of production take place on site or not, and Brazil accepts GI of, for services, which is not accepted in the Europe. These differences can pose challenges for greater commercial integration between the two countries and for the mutual recognition of GIs, for sure. And although the use of gratifying expressions or signs is, is authorized in Brazil, it's not in, the, in, in Europe, in Italy. Even in Brazil, these expressions must be unambiguous. Consumers cannot be misled, whether by action or omission. And the ENPI, the Brazilian IP office, has no police power, but the consumer can take individual or collective legal action if they feel they have been harmed in any way. So, uh, well, I conclude my presentation. Here are uh, some pictures of me and my colleague Wilson. I know we don't have uh, time 
for questions in this event. But if you have any question or follow up, please send us uh, emails. We'll be more than happy to answer as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Um, it's been a really interesting presentation. Uh, also, um, I, um, I was really, um, I was listening about a case that you introduced about also the flag. So um, a very well known case, very much discussed about the Italian uh -huh. sun. So thank you for bringing this up. Um, so I'm sure that people will write to you because then, you know, uh, it's raising many questions. Um, about these two different cases and approaches between Italy and uh, and Brazil. Thank you very much. So we will go to the um, another the other speaker and our presentation um, and uh, to Rita De Rico. Uh, Rita De Rico, Professor De Rico, is an associate professor at Roma 3 University. Uh, she's a professor of economic history. Uh, her research interests uh, have a focus on uh, socioeconomic history and uh, in the 19th and uh, um, between the 19th and the 21st century. Uh, she has written extensively uh, on various topics uh, in the agri-food sector, linking particularly food to origins and production. Uh, I will uh, leave the floor to Professor De Rico, who will introduce us to her topic is actually very much connected to the previous one. And uh, we'll have uh, the historical approach uh, of Pecorino Romano, the origin of a PDO cheese. Uh, Professor De Rico, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandra, for your introduction and uh, Patricia for invitation to the seminars. Uh, I share my presentation. Um, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have uh, <laughs> a new. Oh. I have a problem with my um, screen because this is a new version of Teams, so it doesn't work as it uh, should do. Um, maybe uh, Patricia can share it yeah, for you. Maybe it's we... better, yes. Thank you. Patricia, would you mind to do that? Just a minute. I'm just opening your presentation, Rita. Thank just you, Patricia. Can you see okay. it? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Please let me know when I have to change the slides. Yes, okay. So, um, okay. Um, uh, yes, my presentation is on Pecorino Romano. You can change slides. And uh, Pecori, you can go to the next slides, please. Um, I can do it myself? Oh, okay. No. The first one, the okay. Pecorino Romano is uh, uh, currently the most produced uh, sheep cheese in Italy, and it has been the most exported Italian uh, cheese during the 20th century. Uh, next figure, uh, please. Okay, uh, I compare uh, export of Pecorino Romano and uh, Grana in Parmigiano. 
so, yes, um, from the end uh, of the uh, 20th century, uh, grana and parmigiano start to be the most exported cheese, but uh, for all the century, uh, pecorino romano was the most exported. Um, you can go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so, uh, it's not, it's, it has been a most important uh, uh, cheese in the um, external market, but it was, it is not uh, the most produced cheese in Italy. So, it's a cheese that had, that had been more fortune in uh, external market, that, uh, um, in interior, um, in internal. And uh, uh, so, you see the most produced uh, uh, PDO cheese actually are grana parmigiano and, uh, um, and grana. <coughs> and uh, uh, Pecorino was, uh, please, can you go to the uh, next? Um, okay. Yes, Pecorino was uh, one of the first cheese to be granted uh, the, recognition, the recognition of designation of origin in 1951. And alongside with Roquefort, uh, followed by Parmigiano and Gorgonzola. Although his name evoke a uh, specific uh, production area corresponding to uh, Roman countryside, uh, the production center of this cheese is uh, actually a center not in Dachum but in Sardinia. Uh, you can go to the next, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you see the production uh, of Pecorino Romano in Sardinia uh, increased, while uh, that of inflation has decreased to the actual, uh, to the 3% uh, almost in recent time. Um, Besides this evolution, there are uh, not only competition in between entrepreneurs from different regions, but mostly the uh, transformation of the original territory uh, and the production condition over time. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? Thank you. Sheep farming and the production and of uh, sheep cheese, wool and meat were typical activities of the Agro-Romano. This was the countryside, this is the city of Rome, circled in black, uh, and all this was the uh, Agro-Romano, the countryside of uh, about 200,000 hectares, which were uh, uncultivated and plagued by malaria, uh, which surrounded the, uh, which surrounded Rome. Uh, surrounded room. The environmental condition, uh, next uh, slide please. Yes, the environmental condition of the agro, of the agro didn't allow for uh, uh, intensive uh, agriculture or wheat cultivation, but uh, were compatible with the seasonal rit or uh, rit or transhuman pastoralism. Uh, which exploited uh, natural pastures from uh, autumn to uh, the, to late spring, when there was no uh, the danger of malaria. Uh, next, please, <laughs> Patricia. Thank you. Uh, Transhuman flow composed of a uh, thousand uh, uh, sheep come from the Apennine and mostly from the Abruzzo regions. Uh, next, uh, please. Uh, Sheffer were the first link in the production chain of Pecorino Romano. Uh, they limited the set themselves to the seasonal production, to a seasonal production uh, from October to May of a semi finished fresh cheese and the typical primitive uh, uh, straw hats that was scared in, uh, in the Agro-Romano. The subsequent phase 
of salting and ripening uh, were carried out in facilities in Rome by entrepreneurs uh, who also ended the, the sale of the cheese. Uh, can you change, please, uh, Patricia? Thank you. Pecorino Romano was not a luxury cheese, such as famous cheese, uh, Parmigiano or Roquefort, that, which was a uh, uh, sheep cheese sold too. It's affordable price, designed it as a food for poorest classes, uh, uh, poorer classes, while more uh, refined Roman consumer preferred Parmesan or cheese uh, made from cow or buffalo milk with a more delicate taste. Pecorino was mainly sold on uh, local markets and uh, uh, in neighbor region until the end of 19th century. Uh, please, can you change the slides? Thank you. Since the end uh, of 19th century, uh, uh, external factors have contributed to the expansion of its trade behind the traditional markets. The first was uh, the, the foreign demand of emigrants in the Americas, uh, which start from the late 19th century onward. Uh, United States uh, emigration from Italy uh, reached its site between 1902 and 1914. This was the Great Italian Migration. And the uh, United States surpassed South America, which was the preferred um, destination in the first phase. Uh, United States surpassed South America uh, as the favorite destination and received more than 70% of all Italian emigrants. And in this phase, the southern regions, Campania, Sicily, Abruzzo, came to provide the majority of emigrants, uh, while emigrants for northern Italy decreased, and they were uh, the mostly in uh, the more important uh, number in, uh, uh, in the first uh, phase. Uh, please, can you change, Patricia? Okay, uh, this graphic uh, showed the uh, destination of uh, uh, Pecorino, Rom mar destination market of Pecorino Romano in 1911. As you see, 70% uh, of the uh, export were, uh, was destined to the um, United States. Uh, this was because uh, um, immigrants were from uh, um, uh, Italian, mostly from uh, southern Italy, uh, where sheep cheese were more consumed uh, than cow cheese, which was more uh, consumed in North Italy. <coughs> uh, so, uh, uh, please, thank you. Yes, the second, uh, so, that was the first important factor. The second was the role of entrepreneur, who mostly uh, come, uh, who mostly come from uh, um, other region from Lazio, and uh, such as uh, Bertoli, for example, uh, and they began exporting the pecorino product uh, produced in Lazio. They uh, build, they start building uh, a uh, warehouse on the outskirts of Rome for salting and ripening the pecorino and uh, exporting it abroad. During the uh, first decade of the 20th century, around 30 companies were established in, uh, 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 for, uh, for the export of pecorino romano. Um, please, uh, can you go? Thank you. So this is a, a graph that shows the uh, export of uh, pecorino, uh, which uh, failed in, uh, during uh, the, um, the First World War. So, um, uh, 
Following uh, his uh, success, uh, the first imitation appears such as that of Bacchino, uh, which was a cheese produced in Lombardy, using the same techniques of Pecorino Romano, but with cow's milk instead of sheep's milk. And this was offered a lower price and competed with Pecorino Romano in foreign market. Uh, can you change, please? Thank you. Uh, the main transformation in the production of Pecorino in Lashem occurred, uh, occurred only in the final stage with the emergence of large cheese uh, ripening warehouse capable of ensuring high standards of quality and uniformity. Because, of course, not all emigrants uh, uh, from South knew Pecorino Romano, but Pecorino Romano was the most standardized and uh, in large quantities, so was suitable for the export. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, uh, this was the uh, transformation, due to transformation in the last phase of production. The initial phase of semi-finished product carried, carried out by Schaeffer continued to be characterized by fragmentation, so remain traditional uh, as ever. Uh, since the beginning of 20th century, uh, entrepreneurs began to move uh, the production of Pecorino to Sardinia, which was the region of Italy richest in sheep. And uh, that's because uh, Pecorino production in Lashem was not enough to meet the growing dem demand of American market. In Sardinia, they uh, built facility to process the milk directly purchased uh, from the shepherd, transferring the production technique to the island, to Sardinia. Uh, can you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we can ask why develop uh, industrial production of Pecorino in Sardinia and not uh, in Lashem or in Rome. First, because uh, Sardinian chefs were not familiar with Pecorino Romano. They produce uh, uh, famous uh, sheep cheese like as Fiore Sardo, but uh, they, uh, they were not uh, uh, familiar with uh, uh, tradition of Pecorino Romano. Uh, second, uh, the, we, uh, we, we say the greater, uh, the greater availability of sheep milk in uh, Sardinia compared to Lashem. And uh, another, um, uh, the, uh, the third uh, 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 element was the limited opportunity uh, for pastoralism development in the agro-romano due to the conflicting interests between the needs of pastoralism and those of reclaiming of the agro-romano, which accelerated between 1920s and 1930s. Oh. Transhuman pastoralism, which was a central element of the latifondium in Lashem, was becoming marginal in the agriculture landscape of Rome. This also explains why Italian institution uh, did intervene much uh, uh, in, uh, in favor of, uh, uh, of pastoralism. Uh, can you change, please? Thank you, Patricia. Um, similar case of uh, transferring typical local production to other regions were frequent in Italy uh, in 1920s, 1930s. Um, and uh, a contrast of interest emerged between uh, the milk and the semi-finished producer on one side and the, in and the industrial transformers. This latter, uh, unlike uh, the uh, <coughs> Uh, the producer of milk and semi-finished uh, pro uh, product uh, could relocate uh, plants 
and uh, uh, production where they find where they can, they can find a better condition and the case of provolone is uh, exemplary this is a typical cheese from southern italy particularly from campania which has been produced mainly in lombardy since uh, 1930s uh, and and Rita, was... sorry you you have three more minutes uh, okay <clears throat> uh, okay, it was uh, Auricchio, uh, Gennaro Auricchio, uh, who moved uh, north in search of more abundant and cheaper milk, bringing with them production technique. And the other, please. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, the, ush- the issue of protecting uh, typical cheese uh, in uh, foreign trade was addressed not only in Italy, but also uh, um, in international context. Uh, in 1930, uh, um, the International Institute of Agriculture, uh, the SFA, uh, con- convened an international conference to reach an agreement on the use of the nomination of cheese in international trade. Um, uh, but uh, the accord, uh, the agreement, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, uh, was not reached, and because the crisis of international trade and the closure of market during the Great Depression uh, pushed into the background the issue of uh, uh, protecting typical cheese. Next, please. So after uh, the uh, after the Second World War, the debate resumed, and uh, uh, at Stresa uh, was uh, 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 Stresa Convention. Uh, nine, nine countries meet to uh, to reach an agreement, uh, and uh, uh, in the in this in this occasion, two categories were established: a list A which control designation of origin, including cheese, uh, whose designation was prerogative of a given country. And the first cheese was in list A, was Pecorino, Roquefort, Parmigiano and Gorgonzola, and a list B, typical designation, including cheese, which could produced in country other than the region of origin, but they have to add the uh, actual place of production and uh, respect the production technique. Please, next. Uh, ne- thank you. Um, you have one more minute, so maybe you want to just go to the conclusion. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. We have to respect the time for, okay, the, okay, for the okay. YouTube. So, um, um, IQ, if you can go to the next, huh? thank you. Um, the production of Pecorino over the past uh, 50 years has, in, uh, has increased, but uh, um, Sardinian production significantly, significantly strengthened, uh, but uh, while the lesion had declined. And uh, this was accompanied by progressive disappearance of distinguishing uh, uh, features. Next, please. Uh, uh, next. <laughs> uh, please, next one. Okay. This was because uh, uh, this uh, <laughs> um, because uh, the expansion of uh, Roman of Rome of uh, urban space in the uh, in the. Uh, in in the rural areas, and uh, uh, and uh, also of the disappear of um, the reduction of uh, breed uh, of sheep uh, breeding, uh, following the reduction of flock sheep milk production in the Roman countries countryside decreased. So, Latian producer Pecorino Romano start to buy milk in Sardinia, as uh, they be allowed for supply. Uh, of Romatilia uh, through far the territory included in the protected production area. Um, also, the um, uh, uh, the breeds, the sheep breeds, 
uh, change? Uh, can you go to the next? Okay. So the Pecorino Romano produced in Lazio has become in the last uh, decades a niche product. And uh, the producer of uh, Lashum are claiming now a brand of origin uh, distinct from that of Sardinian producers. If I have just uh, a minute, so if, uh, otherwise I can uh, just for conclude, otherwise I can stop you. <laughs> can you go to the next, uh, if I can, uh, or otherwise not? Okay, thank you. So the connection to the terroir as a combination of environmental and cultural factors remains a necessary condition to justify the protected de denomination origins status of a product. But this status can change if environment condition change. What would have been the history of Pecorino Romano if the law on PDO had been approved in 1930? The production of soil lesion would not have been uh, enough to meet the growing demand, and therefore it would not have been the most produced uh, and export the Italian cheese until the 1990s. Thank you, and excuse me for uh, my <coughs> Thank you very much presentation. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you. It's been a very, very interesting presentation about all the historical uh, background of uh, Pecorino Romano PDO. Um, interesting very much so also to know about uh, counterfeiting cases at all times I uh, will now give the floor to um, Massimo Massimo Vittori who is the managing director of Origin Origin is an organization that is promoting an international network for their geographical indications um, uh, beef, uh, the is, is topic will be, uh, it will be discussing today, geographical origin and trade opportunity, meeting the growing expectations of consumers and uh, in terms of authenticity and sustainability. A, beef, a brief bio of Massimo. Uh, Massimo um, has also been uh, working as legal advisor for the International Trade Center and also for, um, for he has uh, actually carried out several projects for the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. Uh, he has a degree in international relations and also a, an LLM in intellectual property law uh, and uh, at the uh, University of Turin. Um, we can uh, um, now leave the floor to Massimo and, uh, and also 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Can you hear me? Very well. Very well. Let me now share the presentation. Anyway, thank you so much also to Patricia, to Impi, to, to all the stakeholders involved. Here's my presentation. Can you see it? You yes. can see it very well. Excellent, excellent. So briefly, maybe I'll take just 10 minutes, you know, to to basically um, really focus on, on a few ideas. But first of all, to congratulate the organizers of this uh, meeting, because really it shows how geographical indications touch upon so many different topics, uh, from history to sociology to economics to law. And actually, I would like to bring maybe to the table a, a new um, element, which is the one of innovation of sustainability, because sometimes when we think about tradition, we forget that also there are like uh, evolution in society. And um, I believe that geographical indications in spite of their, um, on top of their strong attachment to the tradition, they also have a lot to say in the new scenario of sustainability. And to some extent, they can also incorporate some elements of innovation to respond to the sustainability challenges. So we make it this debate very rich. Briefly, you know, I'll touch upon four points, two, two words about origin, the organization I represent, although Alessandra, you said already, a few things, uh, the IP component and trade dimension of GIs, uh, the sustainable development dimension, which is really actual, I think, at uh, this very moment in time, and then I'll try to draw some conclusions. 
So Origin is the global alliance of GI association, GI group and institutions. We work for a more robust, we advocate for strong protection of GIs in national laws, international treaties, bilateral treaties. But also we promote GIs as a sustainable development tool with uh, a governance at the local level, which is extremely positive, especially for, for more producers. And in this respect, uh, having today some 600 associations from 40 countries in the world, here are a few members, um, it, it became also a platform where GI associations, GI groups can share experiences, not only in the field of legal, not only in the field of sustainability, but in any field touching upon geographical indications. So, the IPR dimension, that's, you know, as we mentioned, uh, the, there are at the moment uh, some 15,000 GIs recognized around the world in national jurisdictions. There are more than 100 in Brazil, uh, 3,000 in the European Union, more than 5,000 in China, and it's growing everywhere. You know, if you look at uh, uh, websites of um, IP offices in charge of GIs or for the European Commission in the EU, uh, you see that every month there are new recognition of GIs, that this is growing, and it's really, truly global. It's not just European. Mm, and um, it became now a rec uh, universally internationally recognized intellectual property right. Uh, the great majority of countries provide, like, for instance, Brazil, they provide sui generis independent IP systems for GIs. Uh, it has been recognized in bilateral treaties, uh, for instance, the FTA between the European Union and Mercosur, which concerns Brazil, which is not yet concluded. It's really at the, at the very final stage of conclusion, but there are so many others involving the European Union, involving other countries, not only the European Union. So it's uh, in bilateral treaties as well. Now there is a practice for countries to promote the recognition of their GIs in foreign jurisdictions. And also quite interestingly, also at the international level, especially with the evolution of the WIPO Lisbon system. Uh, as you know, the Lisbon Agreement of 58 has been modernized in 2015 uh, in Geneva into the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement, which has attracted now, I think today, some 54 jurisdictions around the world, including the European Union, uh, including the African uh, Intellectual Property Organization, uh, covering 17 jurisdictions in Central and Western Africa. So uh, I know that I was in Brazil last year for a conference in Brasilia, involving uh, various ministries, trade, justice, INPI was there. There is a, a debate in Brazil about the benefits uh, other countries are thinking of joining so it's the IPR dimension has been consolidated you know if you look back 30 years ago probably was not the case there was still some debate today a clear uh, link between um, GIs and IP I mean GIs are part of IP there is no question about it anymore um, trade dimension very interesting I would like just to show share with you some data that we collected at origin, we promoted uh, uh, since 2022, a survey among 25, 30 GIs that uh, part of our network, also beyond our network in all sectors, agriculture, wines, spirits, and craft. And each year we have a specific topic. But what I'm interested here is to show you the turnover of 25 GIs um, is about 68 billion. Among them, you have like Champagne, you have Parmigiano Reggiano, you have very, some very iconic GIs. And more than 60% of that turnover goes into export. So that's quite interesting. That's are the 20, 2022 data. Just to tell you that GIs are very important at the local level. In fact, if we look also at the jobs generated, about 25 GIs of this panel are almost half a million direct jobs. But also, and then those jobs cannot be delocalized, you know, because they are really can only be in that geographical area because you have to respect the conditions 
the climate conditions, but also the, the human skills that are unique to that area. But also it translates often in an interest by people outside, could be in local, regional, national and international markets. And that's interesting to show that level. That's why, if I go back to what I said earlier, GIs are more and more part of trade treaties. Even FTA, they have a chapter on GI with a, chap a chapter on IP with a sub chapter on geographical indications. Um, and then I want to come to the this like you know new part, you know new challenge is the one about sustainability. Apart from the GIs, I think. Today, this is one of the major challenges of our economies, societies, how to think of a new paradigm which um, takes into account the interest of the present generation without uh, compromising you know, the possibility for future generations to pursue their own values that are economic, environmental, and social. Wow. These are the clear three dimensions. Um, of, of uh, sustainability. And um, why uh, there, is a, there is this debate? Because we have understood that uh, with climate change, with uh, the pandemic, uh, the, the importance to find an equilibrium and you have two pressures that concern all economic sectors, including agriculture, including crops. On the one hand, you have the sustainable development goals yeah. of the United Nations. So countries are adopting legislations that concern sustainability objectives. On the other side, I've mentioned here some top sustainability purchasing drivers. Consumers themselves, they request, they want more information. They want to know the environmental, the social impact of the production, not only the price, Okay, which that they sometimes they're ready to pay even an higher a premium price to products that have that deliver sustainable values in terms of environment, limiting the impact in terms of social. How do you remunerate the primary producers? How do you remunerate all the actors that are involved in the production, not just the multinational or the company or the owner of the company that assemble the products? Okay. So that's um, quite interesting because GIs find themselves, I would say, very comfortable in this new environment. For all the reasons that the previous speakers have mentioned, you have local productions limited to a geographical area that cannot be delocalized. So there is an attention to the territory. Uh, there is a protection of the tradition, of the savoir faire of the people. There is a governance, there is an association, and there is the need to remunerate all the actors in the value chain, not just the transformers, but also the primary producers. And there are also controls. So GIs, in the GI scheme, being subject to an independent control, which is also something that sustainability progress should do because you cannot just claim to be sustainable. You need to verify and you need to prove that. So the fact that GIs are already subject to controls makes it you know, somehow easier for them to um, respond to the emerging sustainability challenges. So I see GIs very much into the spirits of the time. Of course, we cannot say that GIs are sustainable by definition. That would be maybe too much, you know, in terms of making that statement. But we can see that GIs already respond to some of the sustainability challenges and they are in a very privileged and well good position to respond to the emerging one. And also the fact that all actors in a given value chain, the producer, the transformers, are part of an association when where this association exists. This is one of the challenges that uh, out of the 15,000 GIs we have in the world, not all of them have an association. And this is something that should really work on you know, in terms of uh, national authorities, uh, cooperation agencies really help those associations to get structured. But the interesting element here is that 
if you have an association, if you have a product specification, you can really scale up any further progress you will make uh, in terms of sustainability. So if we want to uh, draw some conclusions to that, uh, we can say that uh, GIs have this potential to bring the local to the global in a sustainable way. So very much attention to local value chains, uh, very much attention to local areas, uh, very high redistribution of the added value among primary producers and transformers, uh, protection of authenticity, but also the potential to meet those trends that international consumers, especially young generations have in terms of authentic product, sustainable product. So, and this is why actually we have this increase in registrations because there is like sort of GIs being part of the spirits of the time in, in that sense. So there are tremendous opportunities for local producers. We understand, we saw the legislation in Brazil. Sometimes there are like uh, immigration communities, you know, that moved from Europe uh, to, to the Americas, it can be North America, can be South America, can be Brazil. And sometimes they feel that they brought some uh, sour fare themselves. But today we have to ask ourselves, today do consumer would appreciate to have an Italian flag or a Spanish flag or a French flag into a product which was not really produced into those countries? Is it really in the spirit of the time? Does it match the, does it respond to the requests of consumers in terms of authenticity, in terms of trustability, in terms of really having an experience more than just knowing really the tradition rather than just purchasing a product. So that's, I think, a, a question we should ask ourselves and think that maybe to respond to those authenticity and sustainability objectives, GIs can be, of course, not the response to all the problems, but can be part of the solution, especially in agriculture, especially for small producers, for indigenous communities. We have talked about uh, the Amazon forest. So I think it's very much into uh, the spirit of the time. Of course, the challenges are I creating an association of producers once the GI is registered is crucial in order to have all those beneficial effects and, and possibility to to basically respond and to even do more in terms of sustainability. So I think I'll stop here because it's exactly uh, three o'clock. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm very concerned with time. You <laughs> also have time. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so being, thank you being based in Switzerland, although I'm Italian, yes, but being based in Switzerland, I became very, very punctual. <laughs> very yeah, you are. Definitely you are. Yes, very interesting your presentation. I. I actually like the idea of uh, matching sustainability also with authenticity, because sometimes we always talk about sustainability, especially now with the revision at, at the EU level, you know, of, uh, so it's it's really uh, an interesting topic. But also uh, these two together, I mean, they, they mean the holistic approach is necessary. And I really appreciated this view. Um, Thank you, Alessandra, for mentioning. I forgot it was in my notes. I didn't mention, but in the new EU regulation for wines, spirits, and agricultural GIs, there is a possibility, voluntary, of yeah. course, not compulsory, to include sustainability criteria in product specification. Aware, the legislator hero is aware of the efforts that the sector is doing to to show more in terms of sustainability. Although some elements of GIs are, are already sustainable as I was trying to elaborate and to explain. Absolutely, and also the importance of like not only improving like all the GIs and what we've all done here with all these seminars is that, that despite all different approaches, it's not just uh, uh, helping you know, the, the local and the regional um, uh, identity, let's say, but also it helps the, the GDPs of a country, as you mentioned with, the, you know, with your slide with the export. 
and also with the other previous speakers. And uh, thank you very much. I would like to go now the, the floor for the conclusions to uh, Patricia Barbosa, who has been uh, um, not, not telling her during this seminar. So she, we became really good friends. So, in, But also she's been doing her postdoc uh, and um, uh, on this on this actually topics uh, uh, about the origin of products. So we we went we've been discussing uh, so so much uh, about what to bring for and uh, which kind of topics we could alight. So thank you very much, Patricia, for also having this um, good eye on uh, selecting uh, specific topics for all our seminars. So I leave. Thank you, Alessandra, for joining the idea. Yes, they were indeed speeches with, with a lot of uh, valuable information. I like it very much. And I also want to thank you, Tabata, Fernando, Rita, Massimo, for kindly sharing your knowledge with us in this morning in Brazil. And I also like to thank the presence of you who have stayed with us so far, and also Giovanni and your careful support that allowed this broadcast to happen without problems. And once again, thank you so much, Alessandra, for your amazing help. And this is the end of the Labyrinths of Origin webinar series, people. And if you visit any webinar, please visit ZionPI's YouTube channel to watch the first and the second webinars, and the ESEN's YouTube channel to watch the last two. I hope you enjoyed. It was a pleasure to be with you all, and bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe everyone would like to show and say goodbye so we can. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia, Alessandra. Bye bye. Other. Bye bye. Thank you. All. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Ciao.